Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out on this day that really should have been a snow day, we can all agree. Um, and especially thank you to our panelists uh, for making it here today. Uh, this is the third in our Sador Lecture Series, What is a Criminal? Uh, which is called, as you know, Criminal Mind, Substance Use, and Mental Health in the Justice System. The Sador Memorial Lecture Series was established in 1965 in, in memory of Saul O. Sador of Manchester, New Hampshire. The purpose of the series is to offer the university community in the state of New Hampshire programs that raise critical and sometimes controversial issues facing our society. The University, university of New Hampshire Center for the Humanities sponsors these programs, and we're very grateful to them for it. Um, I am going to introduce our panelists, but first I want to tell you about the next installment in this series. Uh, we're having an event on January 28th, which will be a little different from the normal lecture format in that it will be a performance. Um, there is a group in Maine called Maine Inside Out that works with um, young people who are in the juvenile detention facility there, and they create dramatic works based on their experiences. So they are going to come and do a performance for us as well as a panel. It will be in the Hennessy Theater from 5 to 7 on January 28th, and we really hope you can all make it. It's going to be very exciting. Um, at this point, I'm going to introduce our panel. They will each do a short presentation, and then we'll open it up for questions. I'll give people a minute to get settled. Hello. So we're very happy to have with us today, uh, starting here, Joseph Lascaz. <laughs> Thank you from the ACLU of New Hampshire. He is the smart justice or organizer for the ACLU of New Hampshire. Having over 10 years of firsthand experience with the incarceration system, Joseph's work now focuses on advocating for criminal justice reform in New Hampshire. A wholehearted believer in the power of community building, Joseph's work is founded on the notion that those impacted by the incarceration system are best positioned to leave re reforms of it. Under the ACLU's Smart Justice Campaign, he has collaborated on various initiatives with the NAACP, hashtag cut50, is that how you say that? <laughs> and uh, Lyft. Next we have Anne E. Parsons, Associate Professor of History and Director of Public History at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, which we're so happy that she was able to join us for a very um, quintessential New Hampshire day in the snow. Um, her new book, From Asylum to Prism, Asylum to Prison, Deinstitutionalization and the Rise of Mass Incarceration After 1945, which is from University of North Carolina Press in 2018, analyzes the connections between the politics of incarceration and the deinstitutionalization movement of the mid-20th century. Her work emphasizes how the lack of community health services and the fear of mental illness created an epidemic of mental illness within the prison system. She's also the curator of Care in Custody, A History of Mental Health, a traveling exhibit sponsored by the National Library of Medicine. Thank you for being here. And finally, we have Tom Velarde, um, who is the Stratford County attorney. He oversees criminal prose prosecutions with the exception of murder cases in Stratford County. He has been a prosecutor in New Hampshire for over 20 years and has helped to create alternatives to incarceration. He is a founding member and team member of the Circuit Court Mental Health Court in Rochester and a team member on the Stratford County Adult Treatment Court. He also created the Habitual Offender Academy, which helps people with criminal records regain driving privileges. Thanks for being here, Tom. Um, at this point, I will uh, ask Joseph to start with his presentation. So I'll pull it up here. So how's everyone doing tonight? Everyone's good? Okay, well, thank you to everyone for coming out here tonight on this cold, wintry evening to listen to what we have to say. We are gonna be looking tonight at human warehousing. And that's a term that refers to the housing of people together while they're awaiting the end of their lives, such as jails, prison systems, nursing homes. And we're gonna look at whether or not this environment actually is a conducive environment to correcting, treating, and rehabilitating the people that are there when they suffer from substance abuse and mental health disorders. So before we get into that, let me give you a little bit of background information about myself. My name is Joseph Lascaz. I am the Smart Justice Organizer for the ACLU of New Hampshire, which is the American Civil Liberties Union. And we are one of the oldest and largest civil liberty organizations in the nation. We have 54 affiliates that are operating right now under the same mission to defend the constitutionally guaranteed rights of every person. Under the ACLU's leadership, 
The Smart Justice Campaign, which I am the organizer for, was launched here in New Hampshire, and it's also throughout the whole nation. And the overarching goal is to safely reduce the prison population by 50% nationwide. And the way that I go about doing this in New Hampshire is through inner office collaborations with our legal and legislative department, but by also directly working with people that have been impacted by the incarceration system through community building and in empowering people to take stances on issues that they feel are important. So let's just get into why we're here tonight, okay? So before we begin, we're gonna take a look at what is the actual aim and goal behind the jails and prisons systems, okay? We're gonna actually take a look at what is their purpose. So I'm gonna read two definitions to you, the definition of punishment and the definition of correction, and we have to really think about what is the purpose of our jails and prisons when we think about people with substance abuse issues, mental health, and the purpose of the jail? So the first definition is that of punishment. And it says that punishment is the infliction or imposition of a penalty as retribution for an offense. Is that the definition that we think of when we think of our correctional system? Or do we think of the treatment and rehabilitation of offenders through a program involving the penal custody, parole, and probation. Now, while penal custody, parole, and probation are in the second definition, when we look at the overall essence of what these two definitions say, we have to think about what is the purpose of the correctional system when it comes to these people, because over 90% of the people who are incarcerated are gonna be released one day back to society. So if they're gonna be released, making sure that their issues are treated and corrected and they're rehabilitated in a safe way should be the goal. And as we move forward from this, and we're thinking about how punishment is an aspect of the criminal justice system, it's not the goal. And we see that retribution is a word that was used. So I ask, what does retribution look like for someone in a mental health crisis or with a substance abuse disorder? All right, for all the students in the room, you guys are used to this. And for everyone else who is not in school right now, you guys remember this. We're gonna take a real quick pop quiz, okay? I'm gonna put two pictures up, and the question that I'm gonna ask is what is the difference, okay, the main difference behind the purpose of the construction of these facilities? So what's the purpose? So when we take a look at these two pictures, Spitfire 3, Random answers, real quick. What do we think is the purpose behind the construction of these two facilities? Anyone can just spit fire any random answers out. Confinement. Confinement, okay, that's a good one. Anything else? Seclusion. Seclusion. Mm -hmm. That's a great one, I see what you're thinking. Anything else, one more, one more quick one? Punishment, that's good. Those are all great answers. And the thing that we need to consider is this. The difference between the purpose of these two, these two facilities is one of these facilities was made to warehouse humans, one of these was made to warehouse animals. So we really need to think about when we are treating people with mental health and substance abuse disorders, is the environment that is similar to caging animals, the same one that we want to use when it comes to treating and rehabilitating people who have made mistakes and are trying to get their lives back in order. Currently in the DOC, the New Hampshire Department of Corrections, there is the residential treatment unit which is supposed to treat individuals that have mental health and substance abuse disorders. I put this picture up because, these two pictures up because I want to tell you a short story. I was incarcerated for 13 years at the New Hampshire Department of Corrections before working with the ACLU. During that time, I personally have witnessed and seen people with these conditions, mental health and substance abuse conditions, struggle with trying to get their lives back together. 
The reason why I have this cell, the picture of the cell that these people are treated in up in particular, is because while I myself have not spent time in that cell as a mental health or substance abuse patient, I myself have spent considerable amount of time in that exact cell under the punitive segregation, which is a disciplinary unit that is housed directly underneath it. And the residential treatment unit is the only unit in the entire facility that mirrors in construction the solitary confinement units and the close custody units, which are the punitive segregation units. The DOC said in 2016 that 48% of the people that were admitted to their residential treatment unit came from secure housing. That means that the people that were being treated for mental health and substance abuse disorders were coming from solitary confinement and from the close custody unit, which I said is directly underneath it, to be treated. So are people that are being taken from a solitary lockdown unit and then being brought to another unit with the exact same environment and conditions really being treated? Are they being rehabilitated? These are what we need to be thinking about because this is not the environment to be doing that. We look at rehabilitation, we see that rehabilitation is a process of restoring someone to a useful and constructive place in society. That should be the goal of why people go through the correctional system. That should be the goal of our treatment of people that suffer from these disorders, not to punish them. But maybe feelings about environment, I mean, maybe stories of environment and feelings is not, is not what moves you, maybe it's numbers. So we'll take a look at some of these numbers to see what supports these theories. So nationally, we see that there's 2.2 million people that are incarcerated at any given point in time in the United States. 67% of these people are said to have a substance abuse disorder. 44% of people that are released nationally reoffend within a given year, okay? Let's look at New Hampshire. New Hampshire currently has 2,700 people just in the state prison system alone. That does not include probation, that does not include parole, or county facilities. Now when it comes to this statistic, I was not able to find a stat that accurately reflects the current population of the New Hampshire Department of Correction. There is no stat that's available. So I could not put one up. But as we'll see in a few seconds, we might be able to gauge where it's currently at. 41% of people reoffend within one year after leaving the New Hampshire Department of Corrections. It is slightly less than the national average, but yet still, that's high. But I'm not gonna just leave you with all doom and gloom and no solutions. So what are the alternatives? What are the solutions to these problems? There are alternatives to incarceration. Does anyone in this room know what drug court or mental health court, have you guys heard of it? Okay, well if you have heard of it or haven't, I'll let you know this. So the aim and goal of drug and mental health courts is to provide a safe alternative to incarceration, to treating individuals who have gotten into criminal matters when they suffer from substance abuse and mental health disorders. In one county alone in New Hampshire, they had 46 people that entered into their mental health court. It was new and they started it. Out of those 46, 46 people that entered, 73% of them had a co-occurring substance use disorder. This means that the people that were in the mental health court hit both prongs of substance abuse and mental health disorders. After completing the course, the, the mental health uh, program, their recidivism rate was only 22%. 22%, less than the national and New Hampshire average. But it doesn't just stop there. 44% of people were able to gain employment. 53% of people gained housing. And out of everyone that went through that program, 84% of people were able to complete this program. With the numbers that are shown here, the promise that's here, there is no way that we can turn away from these alternatives to incarceration. There are other answers other than just lock someone up, throw away the key, and hope they'll be fixed by the time they come home. The reason why I put the employment and housing stat up is because those statistics as you may or may not know, are the top contributing factors to people when they are going to make it when they leave prison or when they're going to, if they're going to reoffend. And when I looked for the national and New Hampshire average for those statistics, I couldn't find one. But the statistic that I did find was actually quite alarming. 
It said that our analysis shows that formerly incarcerated people are unemployed at a rate at over 27% higher than that of the total employment rate during any historical period, including the Great Depression. Again, how can we expect people to stay out of the prison systems if we are not fixing the issues that they are suffering from? So moving forward, what can we do? We've already identified our problem. We know that the incarceration system is increased by warehousing people with substance abuse and mental health disorders. We know that the incarceration system is ill-equipped to help people with substance abuse and mental health disorders. We know this, period. There is no, there is no other way of describing it, okay? And what are our solutions? The solutions that we have start, first of all, with ourselves. We have to reform our thinking first and foremost when it comes to substance abuse and mental health disorders. We need to really think about how we view them when we are talking to people in our families, when we are talking to people at our work and in our communities. We need to expand our use of alternatives to incarceration. New Hampshire has 11 counties, but only six of them are operating right now with drug courts and even fewer with mental health courts. We also need to let our representatives and our senators hear from us. Our senators and representatives are elected by our votes. And if these are issues that matter to us, then we need to make sure that they let, that we need to make sure that we let them know that we are taking these issues seriously and so do they. How many people in this room know who their senator is? Okay, that's more than most, good. For those that don't know, your homework is to go home Figure out who your senator is and make sure that you can let them know by calling them, emailing them, or sending them a message that criminal justice reforms and alternatives to incarceration are issues that you take seriously and want to see changed. If you are someone that would like to get involved in this work or this work is something that you feel passionately about, you can contact us at any time at any one of these contact points and we would be happy to have you guys with us. In closing, I just want to end with something that I believe captures what the ACLU stands for, what I personally stand for, and what I think that we all are thinking about when we come to this type of gathering and when we're interacting with others. It's by Nelson Mandela, and Nelson Mandela said, for to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have Ann Parsons come and give us some historical context about how um, the situation was created in the first place, if I can manage the PowerPoint this time. Hello. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out. I am from North Carolina. This snow petrifies me, so I'm amazed and impressed that all of you came out tonight. Thank you. Um, thank you also for the Center for Humanities for sponsoring this and for the people who organized it, um, Donna Perkins, Sandy Coy, Kate Gaudet, and Alex Holson Kemper. Um, for me, it's a particular privilege to participate in the Sador lecture series because as a historian, I'm really committed to the concept that we study things that matter to people. And that's really what this lecture series is about, is about trying to focus on critical issues in society today. So for me, it's an honor to be here. In the 1920s, my great-grandparents -grand on my mother's side had six daughters. The fifth one was named Ruth, and she had severe physical and developmental disabilities. At that time in the 1920s, there were few, if any, supports for people with serious mental health disabilities. And so my family ended up making the incredibly difficult decision um, to place Ruth um, at the Stokely Center for the Feeble-Minded. It was an asylum formed in the 1920s. Um, there's a photograph here on the screen of the Stokely Asylum in Delaware. Um, and in the bottom right, you see a picture of Ruth, my great aunt. It's actually the only photograph um, our family still has of her. Um, she's probably about one and my aunt Sig standing next to her. Stokely was a large institution. Um, at its peak, it had about 700 people as an asylum, um, and it really had very little in the way of treatment. What Joseph was just saying about the lack of rehabilitation, treatment, medical, medical services, that was very much dominated um, asylums in the 1940s and 50s. 
It reflected an age where society responded to mental health conditions by taking people, often removing them from their communities, their families, placing them in asylums on the margins of society, and then trying to um, say that they were providing services there, but it often was underfunded and inadequate. My great aunt lived there for 40 years until she died in 1969. Around the time that she died, um, Stokely and other facilities began to downsize. They act things actually began to change around the time that she died. People increasingly sought community inclusion up oh, by click too fast. Sorry about that. Maybe I can't handle the clicker. <laughs> I'm never good with clickers. Okay. I'm putting the clicker down. Back away from the clicker. Uh, and from current slide. <clears throat> so starting in 1969, many asylums started to downsize. It's a process called deinstitutionalization. And so over time, they got smaller and smaller to the point that a place like Stokely today, actually only Stokely itself, only has about 50 people. For me, I'm inspired by the fact that from 1969 until 2019, so much has changed. The practice of placing people in remote mental health institutions like Stokely have been significantly reduced. And I'm also cognizant that although so many mental hospitals have closed and asylums have closed, there's still this practice of removing people and placing them in large institutions. And today it is in prisons. As many of you most likely know from your classes that you've been taking, the United States today has the highest rates of incarceration in the world, which disproportionately affect people of color, people with mental health conditions and substance abuse addictions. And some of the largest psychiatric providers today operate not in our communities, but in our prisons and jails. We are in a totally different time and place than the 1960s. But in many ways, we face very similar questions to what people faced then. At that time in the 60s, they were facing these huge mental health institutions, some of which had five, 6,000 people in them. And they were wondering, what can we do to change this? Today, there's a crisis of mass imprisonment. And at both times, people with mental health conditions were caught in the crosshairs. For me, I'm gonna talk some now about the history of deinstitutionalization and what that can shed some new light on or how that can shed some new light on how we're working to make change today. What can we learn from that process of a period where there were large institutions, mental health institutions, mental hospitals that closed? What can we learn, that, or learn from, the, from that now? The setting of the story I'll tell you is in 1980s in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania at that time was one of the largest mental health providers in the country. Um, and it had a very interesting governor. Governors are usually not interesting. I find this one interesting. Um, his name was Governor Dick Thornburg. He became the attorney general under Ronald Reagan. He, would, he was a conservative, but he also had a unique connection to mental health in that he had a son with an intellectual disability. This is a photograph of Governor Thornburg, his wife Ginny seated, um, their two sons. Peter, his son, had an intellectual disability from a car accident and brain injury. And when he became school-age, doctors encouraged Dick and his wife Jenny, Ginny to place him in an institution, and they said no. At that time, there was a growing number of parents refusing the stigma that society was placing on kids with disabilities, that pressure to push kids into institutions. The Thornburg family became very active in the ARC, which is an organization that does activism on behalf of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And through that, the Thornburg family became very aware of the problems of these large custodial institutions in the 60s and 70s. When Thornburg became governor, he was conservative. He wanted to balance the budget um, by reducing state services and cutting a lot of um, social supports for people. One of his biggest cost-cutting initiatives then became mental hospitals. He had learned about the problem of mental hospitals through his personal experience, and he was also interested in cutting the costs that they entailed. 
Here, he was not alone. In the 60s and 70s, there was a huge national trend to move away from these large custodial institutions that they said at that time were warehousing people. We may have just heard that word a few minutes ago. There were a couple of big pieces to this change that happened. The first was cultural. In the 1960s, 1970s, there was suddenly this boom of critiques of mental hospitals um, by anti-psychiatry advocate Thomas Saad, sociologist Irving Goffman, and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which was first a book and then a film. These cultural texts were changing the way people thought about institutions, to think of them more as restrictive and oppressive than as places of healing and rehabilitation. There were also changes in psychiatry at the time. Uh, major psychotropic drugs like Thorazine had, had begun being introduced on a mass scale in the 1950s. And there was this new faith that people could receive mental health services in their local communities rather than in these distant asylums. This major movement had a watershed moment in 1963 with the Community Mental Health Act. At that time, John Kennedy signed this legislation and said, I believe that in the future, we will cut our mental hospital population by 50%. That is currently the ACLUs and many other organizations are saying, can we have a future in which we cut the prison population by 50%? John F. Kennedy said this in 1963, a few weeks before he was killed. A final element of change that happened, there was cultural change, legislative change, um, changes in the medical profession that was all leading us to reject these large asylums that held people like my great aunt. A final element was activism. Organizations such as the ARC, the Mental Health Association, advocated against warehousing people in large institutions. And there were grassroots activists who themselves have been impacted by these places. Often these histories are erased in the bigger picture and so it's important to recover them. Um, I did work in Philadelphia finding, um, finding documents about the Alliance for the Liberation of Mental Patients, many people who themselves have been patients and they were organizing for the closure of big hospitals. This is one of the pamphlets I was able to find um, for, from the Alliance in which they were advocating for closing a hospital. And this picture in the back um, is has at the bottom a picture of Farview State Hospital and then a body um, in which the toe tag says rehabilitated. That for them um, encapsulated this place, Farview State Hospital. I would be remiss here with a lawyer, um, people doing legal work if I also didn't mention some of the legal changes that helped uh, move deinstitutionalization along. There were a number of civil, civil liberties law um, uh, lawsuits during this period, often on behalf of patients, that established that people had the right to not be involuntarily committed unless they proved a danger to themselves or others. So all of this is happening. And within this context, Dick Thornburg really works to, with his administration to close mental health institutions down. During his years in office, in only seven years, he closes 10 mental health facilities often arguing that this was a way that the that taxpayers could save millions of dollars. At the same time, they put some money into community beds for people with mental health conditions, and that um, there were some gains in that area. But what I found when I was digging in the archives is a lot of letters from the Mental Health Association saying that many people being released from hospitals can't find work, can't find housing, the money that was being saved from closing these hospitals was not being reinvested into the community. That led to widespread homelessness and also the increased arrests of people being released from hospitals and then being placed in prisons and jails. At the same time that the Thornburg administration was decarcerating its mental hospitals, it also was building up the state's prison system. In some ways, it was continuing a practice of institutionalization in another form. 
the Farview State Hospital that the Alliance for Liberation of Mental Patients argued against, the story of Farview brings to life some of the contradictions of these policies, closing hospitals on the one hand and building prisons on the other. Farview State Hospital was a hospital for people deemed, quote, criminally insane. So that meant that people um, were in the prison system and were diagnosed with serious mental health conditions were moved to Farview, or they were in mental hospitals and deemed a danger um, to other people and were moved there as well. Um, the top is a postcard. They used to have postcards of mental hospitals, which is baffling, but they are out there. Um, the top uh, is actually a postcard of the Farview State Hospital. And then the bottom is a picture from the, from the hospital looking out. It was actually on a mountain looking out over the valley. And you get a sense of the remoteness, right? This is in far northeastern Pennsylvania around Scranton. Um, it's very hard for people to access their families or connect with people. At Farview, um, Farview held a disproportionate number of African-American men, many of whom had diagnoses of schizophrenia or psychosis. There's an excellent book by Jonathan Metzl that came out a few years ago called Protest Psychosis that really traces the implicit bias often in the psychiatric profession during those years um, that informed psychiatrists making these diagnoses and then placing many African-American men in more high security facilities like Farview. Racism and implicit bias was a part of the system. In 1976, Farview was exposed um, to the country through a series of newspaper reportings. A man in particular, Stonewall Jackson, who was from Philadelphia, um, had a serious mental health condition and was um, hospitalized at Farview. He was killed due to abuse by guards and other inmates at Farview. Um, and so a few journalists ended up exposing his story and also the story of Farview. And if you look at Farview, in many ways, it echoes the photographs that we just saw in Joseph's presentation, right? This is what the hospital was and in many ways was like a prison. At that time, organizations, the Alliance for the Liberation of Mental Patients, organized to say, let's shut this place down. And in the 1970s, they were successful. The administration under Governor Schapp in the 1970s agreed that the place was too abusive and they shut it down. They decided to shut it down. When Governor Thornburg came into office, though, he decided, no, I'm going to keep it open. This was baffling to me. Here he's closing all of these hospitals. So what's going on? Why would he close a lot of hospitals but keep Farview open? Keeping Farview open was in many ways part of his war on crime. This war on crime was part and parcel of a larger war on crime and war on drugs in the 1980s. In Pennsylvania, under Thornburg, the war on, war on crime entailed allocating $37 million to the Bureau of Correction for prison construction, changing laws around um, that restricted probation and parole, creating new mandatory minimum sentences, and then finally, pouring millions of dollars into renovating Farview State Hospital. You might say, well, crime is really bad at that time. In fact, in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania had the sixth lowest rate of crime in the country at that time. So instead, it was more of a tough on crime approach that was really popularized, particularly under Reagan. At a time when the governor was closing hospitals, he keeps Farview open. And implicit in this plan is the idea that individuals with serious mental health conditions who committed crimes, the point that they broke the law, didn't deserve the same treatment or rehabilitative approach in their communities as people who were in civil mental hospitals. People were treated more as criminals than as people in need. This story of Farview really plays out nationwide. And here I'll bring up some lines. Let's explain the lines over here. Um, what this is is a graph um, by legal scholar Bernard Harcourt, um, who has, if you look at the middle line, which is dashed, it starts in the 1920s and goes to the 1990s. The da this dashed line in the middle is the rates of people in mental hospitals um, throughout, the, throughout the country. So from the 1920s through the 50s, it really rises, and then almost like a roller coaster, it drops dramatically from the 70s through the 80s. 
The dotted line on the bottom is the rates of imprisonment in the United States, which stay really low um, throughout the country or comparatively low, and then really spike in the 1970s and 80s. These dots and lines reflect in our country that the very moment that we were saying, no, we should not hold people in institutions, they are not rehabilitative, they are not treatment oriented, we ended up embracing a new form of institution, prisons, which we are very much facing today. It also always makes me think as I look at these lines, where are they going to go in the future, right? Are they going to continue to go up and down? Do they go down permanently? In fact, that's very much what Tom and Joseph are working on day to day right now. Over the past 10 years, there's been a major movement for reducing the high rates of mass incarceration and its impact on people with mental health conditions. This is coming from grassroots activists, national organizations like the ACLU, local prosecutors, also from conservatives, people from both, both sides of the aisle. I always wish that history can tell us what to do. What happened in the past, what should we do? I find that it often doesn't tell us um, what exactly we should do, but it does give us an, some ideas. And right now I just wanna share three ideas with you and then we can discuss more in the Q&A. The first is that multi-pronged approaches often make change possible. Don't these issues feel so big and entrenched? Right now, you said there are 2,700 people locked up in New Hampshire. For us in North Carolina, it's something like 48,000, right? What we, in North Carolina, we talk about this. How can we make change? I look at this history, and I'm reminded that through cultural change, like books and documentaries, activist organizing, bipartisan legislation, the work of lawyers, judges, prosecutors, all can work to reduce a reliance on these large institutions as it happened in deinstitutionalization. It's also critical for policymakers to listen to and empower people with direct connections to the criminal legal system who have been affected by them, themsel by them themselves and to have a voice in it. The second idea is that while deinstitutionalization brought about a reduction of the number of beds, it didn't bring about an equitable system of care. It often did not address the underlying issues of racism, poverty, and implicit bias in psychiatry and the criminal legal system. So as we're working to make changes today, how can we be sure to also have an eye towards addressing those underlying issues? And then the final thing is sometimes I hear today um, this idea that we should reduce mass incarceration just to save money. But it's hard because looking at the history of deinstitutionalization, it really shows us somewhat of a cautionary tale. We've got to be somewhat cautious as we look, about that, look at that. How much should we consider reinvesting those resources back into communities for education, job supports, housing, substance abuse, and access to medical care? For me, I'm hopeful. As I think about 1969 and how much has changed since then, I see how far we've come in moving away from these institutions. And for me, I'm also hopeful when I think of 2069 and how my daughters and you all will look back on 2019 and see this system is totally outdated. And it will be one that you have built that is inclusive and supportive of all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, we have Thomas Velarde, our county attorney, to go again from the historic perspective to the here and now in New Hampshire. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's always a pleasure to come back. I attended UNH uh, myself from 1989 to 1993 before going on to law school. Um, and I love coming back here. I always have to say, we didn't have fancy auditoriums like this, but we did have a bowling alley down in the basement. Maybe Mr. Dodopoulos remembers that in the front row there. Just us old guys remember that. Um, so I've been a prosecutor for 20 years, all in Stratford County. You're located in Stratford County, a county of about 275,000 people. The county was founded in 1771. And guess what? We had these problems in 1771. These are problems of the human condition. And what we look at is how do we respond to these issues uh, as a political question, as a moral question, 
you can, you can put it in any context you want, but these are issues that have been around since the dawn of time. I'll tell you what Stratford County's journey was. Uh, you, you heard that I'm a part of not only the drug court, I spent the whole afternoon in court this afternoon with drug court clients, helping them to try to work through um, another week's worth of issues, sometimes a day's worth of issues, sometimes an hour or a minute's worth of issues to try to be healthy and stay in the community. Tomorrow morning, I start my day at 8 a.m. in Rochester Circuit Court, right downtown in Rochester, with mental health court clients trying to do the same thing for them and keep them in the community, keep them connected to the services that they need to live healthy, fulfilling lives and not end up in the places that you saw up in the slides. But how did we get there? Why did we make a choice in Stratford County to take that approach? I hate to tell you, but it's really pretty simple, and it's money, okay? We had to build a new jail. The vexing thing about that was back in about 1982, we had already built a new jail that was supposed to last us all the way into you know, the early 2000s, and we'd already filled it. This is a small county. It's considered to be still a pretty rural county. How were we filling consecutive jails in such a fast time, well beyond what the timeline was for how long they were supposed to last? Didn't make any sense to us. So we hired some consultants to not only build a brick and mortar brand new jail, which is located on County Farm Road um, in Dover, we also hired a criminal justice consultant to help us learn how to not fill up yet another jail. Because it's very easy to fill up jails. I could, you know, with, with uh, the right judge and the right prosecutor, and frankly the right public defender or defense attorney, you can fill up jails all day long, okay? What are you accomplishing? <clears throat> well, we in Stratford County wanted to find out why we're filling up the jail because we have to raise bonds to pay for a new jail, but also what's really driving crime? Did we understand what was driving crime? And that's when we started our journey in about 2001 to figure out what was causing people to commit crimes and how can we attack the behavior behind the crime to maybe prevent crime and to certainly, at least for people who are finding themselves in the criminal justice system, to actually fulfill the primary role of sentencing, which is rehabilitation. It's not punishment. There are three goals of sentencing. Rehabilitation is number one, punishment is two, and then deterrence is number three. The reason why we've been successful with these programs is that, as Joseph showed you one stat from uh, one of the programs, they do work. They're very intensive. You have to make sure that you're building the program correctly and running it correctly, but they do work. That makes people happy. We should not be treating people with a health disease called addiction in a criminal setting. We should not be treating people with mental health issues in a criminal setting, meaning jails or prisons. It doesn't work. It puts off the problem until they get paroled or released, and then they're back out in the community. So this appealed to folks who, you know, treat your brother or sister as yourself, you know, the sort of the feel good from the heart folks. So we had them all set. How did it help the other people who don't take as progressive a view of people with mental health or substance abuse issues? Uh, meaning these are folks, that I hear them all the time, who say, those are bad choices. Um, if they want to use drugs, then they deserve what they get. Um, these are folks who say, um, this person was Narcaned three times, well, that's three times too many, or they should stop after three. There's a lot of views out there about these folks. But the way to get through to those folks was we were able to show, this is the money that you're going to save by keeping people in the community. It costs an awful lot of money to incarcerate someone. Okay, this mass incarceration that we have as a country is costing us billions of dollars, and we're not getting the results that we would expect to get. So we were able to talk to sort of both people of the polar views, um, the heart people and the money people, and they all agreed that this was, okay, this is how you should go about this. And so we keep a lot more people in the community through the programs that we're running than you would normally see. That's how we came to, to sort of stick our toes in the pool and see is this something we should do. But I wanted to share with you um, sort of my own story about 
how I became involved with the mental health side of things. And this could have happened to anyone. I happen to have been the young attorney who was on call this weekend, and so this happened to me, and this is what I swore we would never do again. I was only an assistant county attorney then, but I went back and told my boss, we can't ever do this again. So here's the scenario. It's a Friday night, and a woman who has severe mental disabilities is living safely in a community, in a group home. There is a very specific way to deal with her behavioral issues because she can get extremely unruly and violent, frankly. But she can also be safely managed in the community. Um, and there's literally an instruction book about how to deal with her. Um, she has significant trauma, particularly from male figures from her past. And so there are a lot of triggers. Then if you avoid the triggers, she can be safely monitored and live in the group home. There was someone who was on shift that evening in the group home who either didn't understand or didn't care about the way to, to deal with her. I'm just going to call her June, the way to safely deal with June. And she responded by pulling out a pair of sewing scissors and threatening him. The Barrington police, Barrington's the town um, right next to Dover, the Barrington police respond and tell me what's going on. Um, the folks in the group home, meaning the supervisors, want June removed. Um, so the response was, we will arrest her for felony criminal threatening. Um, she'll go before a judge in the morning. Back then on Saturdays, we still did arraignments on the weekends. And we'll try to figure out what to do with her then. So she's going to spend the night in jail. Because we didn't have any other alternative, or didn't think we had any other alternative about what to do with her. No one had any other ideas. And the folks that ran the group home wanted her out. So the Barrington police hauled June to jail for the night. And at 7 AM, I went and did the arraignment. Um, by then, June had, had settled down. She was very disoriented, obviously, from being put into a jail cell, a bunch of strangers. None of this was good for her. But there she was in a courtroom at 7 AM. Um, getting arraigned, um, the judge was going to release her. The folks from the group home showed up at the arraignment and said, we will take June home. Um, but at that point, June was really, really upset. She felt betrayed by the people who ran the group home, so she um, refused to go with them. Well, at that point, the judge has already done the arraignment. He's left. Um, so now I'm standing on the street in downtown Rochester with June, the two women who were um, sent to bring her home, um, and the Barrington police officer who was there for the arraignment. And June won't get in the car. In fact, um, when they try to put her into the car, she starts destroying the car. She's really, really agitated. She gets out of the car and starts banging on shop windows downtown um, because she's in a frenzied state. We have to call the Rochester police to come downtown, and they say, Tommy, what do you want us to do? And I said, arrest her for disorderly conduct. Okay. That's the system response in, the, in a criminal justice system that is not built to handle addiction and mental health issues. I tell that story not because I'm proud of it, I'm ashamed of it, um, but I did say I would never do that again, and I haven't done that again in about the 18 years since that happened. We have to find an alternative because, as you've heard from the first two presentations, guess what? All those folks who are in institutions the promise that they were going to get mental health services in the community was never followed through with. Okay? We heard about Kennedy's bill to build a network of community mental health centers. A lot of those centers never got built. If they were built, they were never staffed. Um, if they were staffed, they were understaffed. That promise was abdicated almost as soon as it was made. I remember as a little boy growing up in New Haven, Connecticut, going to and visiting the New Haven Green. And right around when Ronald Reagan became president, the New Haven Green turned into a tent city. And these are all the folks who had been put back out of institutions who had no place else to go. And you know what the response was from the people in that area, just like it would be the response of people in almost any area where a tent city springs up? We don't want that here. We don't want to see that. Make those people go away. And what are the tools that police have it was the same tool that I used with June. Find a crime and lock them up. 
All right, so you can see how this happens. It's very easy to have happen when you don't have alternatives, when a system doesn't build alternatives to incarceration. Um, so that's why I'm here tonight, to talk to you about what we've done, why we've done it, share with you that short journey. Um, but this can happen in any community. It, it does happen in every community, frankly. Um, we just don't talk about it. And we don't think about it because remember, I'm an elected official. Um, if someone breaks into your home and steals your TV, I don't know if you as a victim of a crime really care at the outset about whether that person has an addiction or a mental health issue. So part of my job has become talking to victims of crime and um, sort of walking them through what would be the best response to this criminal thing which has traumatized you, um, has cost you some money, but what would you want to see happen out of this case? Um, and I am very proud to say that eight or nine times out of 10, people say, get this person the help that they need. But you have to take that extra step and build up that dialogue with crime victims. Um, but remember, um, police and prosecutors have limited tools to what we can do if we don't provide those tools to them. Um, so I'm very glad that in Stratford County, we've made a decision to say, we've got to treat folks with these conditions, these health issues, not as criminals, look beyond the anger of the crime. Um, you know, there's that saying, uh, don't put people in prison that you're mad at, put people in prison that you're afraid of. And there are a small segment of people who will commit crimes that um, they're scary, okay? They need to probably be segregated out of society because they will hurt you or hurt me just because. That's a very small amount of people. So look at who we're locking up, why are we locking them up, how long are we locking them up for, and what are we doing with them while they're locked up, and what are the alternatives to locking them up? So it's been an interesting journey over just 20 years uh, of my being in, in local law enforcement here. I do wonder what will happen in the next 20 years as um, these initiatives roll out, as drug courts and mental health courts prove themselves. I will sort of join the bandwagon of contacting um, representatives and senators, um, mental health courts, the mental health court that I'm going to go to tomorrow morning, the judge donates the courtroom, I donate my time, the public defender donates his time, and the community mental health center donates their time, and we show up and do this because we think it's the right thing to do. What other places do you know where people are just going to show up and do this because they think it's the right thing to do, and is that a fair way to say, well, this is how you're going to fund mental health courts? You know, so you got to put your money where your mouth is on some of these initiatives and, and get some actual funding to keep these programs running. Otherwise, they go away when, when the interested persons who are volunteering their time go away. But I use it as an example just to show you this is how folks with mental health issues are treated. Um, you got to care. you got to love them like your brother or sister um, and show that you know, putting them in a cell is not the answer. We haven't gotten there yet. I've been beating this drum myself. I know my colleagues probably have too for 20 years. I talk to high school kids. I talk to senior citizens at senior centers about this. And people just don't understand what's actually going on, what um, the police officer working tonight will be faced with, and how he or she can respond in a better way with real results, and have someone to hand this person off to who's actually going to help them. Um, not re-traumatize, uh, not make things worse. So there's so much work to be done, um, but understanding what the issues are first is, is is so important, and we have a lot of public misconceptions about who's in jails or prisons and why they're there. So I look forward to the discussion as we talk about that together this evening. Thank you all. Um, we're going to turn to a question and answer period now. Um, so um, I'm happy to start out unless there is anyone who has a particular question they want to ask. The audience, we want to, do we want to start? We we've, don't have that much time, so I'm willing to go right to the audience. Tom, could you explain what exactly happens in drug court and in mental health court and what positive changes you've seen with respect to the system as it existed previously? And there's a microphone. Can you all share that one? Sure. Thank you. 
Um, thank you. Um, well, the, the before picture would look like um, a typical case. Someone would have a small amount of uh, narcotic drugs would go to prison. They'd go to prison for two to four years, let's say, um, get paroled at that two-year place, and then get out. And then I was astounded as a young prosecutor that they would go back and do drugs again. Um, I didn't understand that. A lot of us didn't understand that. You just went to prison for that. Why would you do it again? We didn't understand what the nature of addiction was. So drug court is designed to, frankly, tolerate what the addiction looks like, which is you don't reincarcerate every time someone uses again. You don't reincarcerate every time there's some sort of behavior change. There is a, a big umbrella of um, clinical people, as well as your traditional probation parole officers, a prosecutor, myself, and a public defender, but our roles are different. We're working in a collaborative manner to try to support the client, um, hold them accountable for bad behavior, um, can't have them committing new crimes, of course, but what's our response to that? Um, and what's the response to relapse, which is so often someone's journey through addiction? Mental health court's the same thing, so an umbrella uh, almost uh, sort of a, a warm blanket of clinicians and uh, in this case probation or a bail supervisor who will work with someone to make sure they're making their appointments, um, doing medication compliance, um, helping with employment. Um, you know, the, when you look at someone who's going through drug court or mental health court, the rates of employment are way, way up. And there is a real cathartic effect to someone who can pay his or her own bills or be warm for you know, five nights out of seven instead of sleeping in a car or in a park. Um, I mean, it's amazing what you do when you take care of the self, what you can do from there. Um, and what we found was a lot of our folks in, in, the, in the mental health and drug court populations, um, you know, we had, let's get you an appointment to have your teeth looked at. Let's get you a pair of glasses that you need. Um, one woman last week, we helped her get her very first form of ID so she could get benefits. Um, you know, some of these folks, they've been on their own since they were little kids. They don't know how to do these things. So it's, it's sometimes it's almost like uh, being a big brother or big sister and helping them navigate systems that are designed to help them but are, so oftentimes are inaccessible um, because going to DHHS uh, is not something that people want to do and um, it's, it's really hard to uh, speak the language that um, uh, the state bureaucrats speak, even though they're trying to be helpful to talk those two languages. So a lot of it's really kind of fundamental learning how to live, um, how to live a healthy life, and how uh, not to want to go back to that life that they had before. Can I, um... Thank you for that um, description um, of mental health and drug courts. and. One thing I just wanted to add, because we're talking about it, um, a colleague of mine in Greensboro, North Carolina, um, studying mental health um, drug courts, um, she's at UNC Greensboro, she's found that um, implicit bias has also been um, at play in some of the mental health courts that she's been studying. So um, there's the, um, at some of the mental health courts she's looking at, there's the possibility of people being removed from mental health courts and sent back into the traditional court systems. And she's found that for the same types of offenses or things that are happening in it, um, that when it's uh, men, particularly African-American men, um, are doing it, they are more likely to be kicked out of mental health courts um, compared to white men um, and that kind of thing. And so I think these things, um, as we're making these reforms, it's still so important to think about the underlying driving forces that led to mass incarceration um, going forward. I just wanted to share that since it's um, some new research. Thank you. Any other questions? You have a question? I was a little late, so Joseph, I apologize if you uh, covered this in your presentation, but I was wondering, um, as a two-fold question, what are the long-term implications of having a felony conviction on your record? And then how does that um, play out when a drug court and a mental health court is still criminalizing these behaviors and your inability to uh, subscribe to that? And how does that affect the rest of your life? So. Okay, that's a great question. So, 
How does a felony impact your life? Well, it impacts your life in several ways. Having a felony is a badge that is displayed to almost every door that you need to get into in life. So having a felony, can it, it shuts a lot of them, and it can impact your employment, it can impact your financial situation, it can impact your housing, it can impact your mental health state, just, just because, so I'll give you an example. Before I worked for the ACLU, when I first came home, I was just released in July of this year. And when I just came home, I came home, filled out, I can't even tell you how many applications for jobs I filled out. I wanted to get a job right away. I was super pumped about it. And as, as the rejection or the adverse action letters, as they call them, came in that I was not, I could not work for this company, this company, this company, this company, and everything was because of a felony, that starts, that starts affecting you because while you, you can make a mistake in life, Getting past that mistake is something that you have to do personally. And when the world keeps holding you accountable to that mistake and keeps flaunting it in your face, it can take away from your, your the, it can take the wind out of your sails. And this, this, this can affect many different, different aspects of, of your recovery, especially when you have a substance abuse and mental health disorder. Individuals I know that have substance abuse and mental health disorders, they feel as if they can no longer productively be a part of society because they have the felony records. But not only do they have the felony records, they're also considered someone that has a substance abuse disorder, and that is a huge stigma that right now needs to be corrected because it's a, it's a disease that people have. We wouldn't, we wouldn't look at people different just because they have cancer or they have something along those lines. So that's, that's how it can affect, and I hope that answers your question. I would just note that uh, we have annulment laws in um, New Hampshire to, to get crimes off your record. Now, these are long waiting periods, but if you complete a specialty court, including a mental health court or a drug court, then at least we've cut what would be 10 years for a Class A felony. That gets cut down to just one year after the completion of the program to have that uh, crime annulled off your record because we're looking at the employability aspect. I will also say awful lot of people in our programming are able to find jobs, but Joseph's right. It's a badge. It's out there. A lot of, a lot of um, breaking through that tier of employers who will take someone with a felony, it's a tough thing to do. So we've incorporated that into our panoply of state laws to try to give another incentive to people. Stick with us for the 12 months, the 18 months, the 24 months is going to take to complete this program because you come out on the other end with a lot better prospects. Um, so that annulment um, statute is a big help. Real quick, just to add to that, um, the annulment that, that, that does work, and the thing though that happens is, in this case in particular, for people that have, uh, let's say, substance abuse disorders whose drugs, um, whose crimes are committed um, directly related to drug, drug use or are drug offenses, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but the, Annulments are only for specific crimes. So not every crime can be annulled. Not every, every felony can be annulled. But in particular, for these nonviolent crimes, um, that when they're related to drugs in particular, uh, the annulment is a, is, a great, is a great tool because it really helps out um, people that are trying to get their lives back together. And Joseph, I have a question for you as well. I'm here. No. Um, yeah, sorry. I don't know why I put the mic away. Um, the, the program that you're working with, I was wondering if you could walk me through what a client should expect before going into the program, kind of such as what type of bedding would they be using, who would they be getting meals with, how often would they be seeing a clinician, what type of clinician they would be seeing, like walk through like the, the expectations that, um, that would occur for a client in that program. Okay, so this, are you talking about the Smart Justice Campaign? Yes. Okay, so the Smart Justice Campaign itself is not a treatment program. The, the goal of the Smart Justice Campaign is to reduce the overall prison population by 50%. So this includes people with mental health issues, substance abuse issues, and, and people who have just generally made bad mistakes in their life and are just trying to get past that and put their lives back together. So the Smart Justice Campaign advocates for the reforms. The Smart Justice Campaign will work with people who have been arrested, who have been incarcerated, and are 
either still incarcerated or out and are trying to get their lives back together and point them in the directions that will help them get to where they need to be in life. But as far as the programs itself, how people are treated in the mental health and drug courts, I'm sure Tom could, could speak more about that, but the people are not housed in an institution when they are in the mental health or drug court. Any other questions? I had a question for you, Jeff. I'm sorry. Just building off of the mental health and drug courts, um, is what is happening with the mental health and drug courts here um, common throughout the entire state of New Hampshire, um, or is it something that needs to be built up throughout the state? Um, just wondering for, you know, here in this crowd. Yeah, uh, drug courts, there's state law that allows each county to choose to have a drug court. So there are 10 counties in New Hampshire with Hillsborough County having two different superior courts, so 11 superior courts altogether. One county has chosen to go a different route. They don't wanna have a drug court. That's a political choice that that county has made. The other nine counties with 10 uh, superior courts in them have decided that they do want to do that. There is no legislation for mental health courts. Mental health courts are, you know, and this is a this is uh, something that we don't talk about enough because drug courts have uh, a fidelity to the ten best practices. These are empirically proven ways to reduce the behaviors that lead into addiction and to keep the community safe because that's the trade-off. If we're going to talk about keeping people in the community, which is a great thing to talk about, you don't want to sacrifice public safety. You all elect me ostensibly to keep you safe, and you are safe for the most part. We don't want to, we don't want to alter that, that balancing. So we're talking about people, keeping people in the community while not sacrificing public safety. The point is you can, you can do that, but if you're not running a program that is, has fidelity to the model, then you've got a big problem, and you're actually doing more harm to your clients um, than you are, you are doing, and you're not getting the public safety payoff. My point is, mental health courts do not have any promulgating legislation. The mental health court in Rochester looks a lot different than the one in Keene, than a lot different than the one in Nashua, and so on and so forth. I'm not denigrating any other mental health court, but where you have such a disparity where they take on the personality of the judge or the personality of another team member, rather than a best practices model, that's where you run into issues with how the program is run. And if you look at literature from the NDAA, the National Drug, uh, the National Drug Court uh, puts out its own uh, critiques of itself as an empirically based program, um, they've gone in and shut down their own drug courts because they don't want to have a, a malfunctioning drug court because you can do so much more harm through having a malfunctioning drug court than having no drug court at all, believe it or not. Um, so there's a lot of self-censoring in the drug court community, but mental health courts don't have that, all right? So we're trying to do our best in these pockets of communities around New Hampshire to try to provide an alternative, um, but until someone actually recognizes this as being something that we should have all across the state because it's the right way to deal with the issue, um, you're, you're not gonna have that. And one other point that I wanted to make, and I always try to fit into my presentations when I talk about these issues is, I go to one court this afternoon, I go to another court in the morning. Do you think the issues that we're talking about are that different in a drug court setting from a mental health court setting? If we hear that 70% about of folks have co-occurring issues, I'm talking about the exact same issues in two different courts. And that's because we still have this really artificial, ridiculous separation of how we treat mental health issues and addiction issues. And if I have one more clinician say to me, well, when they, when they get better from their mental health issues, I'll treat them for their substance abuse or vice versa, um, I probably will not look as cheerful as I look right now uh, when I speak to them and say, how is that possible? Why are we not taking the holistic approach, which everyone knows is the right way to, you don't go to a doctor and, and, and have them only look at one part of your body. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. So there are licensure issues behind it. There are, frankly, some people in one field don't want to deal with people that have uh, present with some other issues. There's some stigmas going both ways 
in regards to how uh, clinicians want to deal with these issues. So we're really lucky in our local program to have clinicians who deal with both sides of, of what is often the same coin. I will tell you the, the honest truth after doing this for about 15 years, I don't know anyone who has used drugs for a long period of time and doesn't at least show some sort of depressive symptomology. I don't know how you separate mental health issues, just like how you separate health issues. I mentioned you know, getting teeth fixed or eyeglasses. How do you separate those from treating another human being? You can't do it, at least not do it as well as you, you can do it if you're looking at a holistic approach. So the drum I've been beating for a long time is again, talk, making people aware that why separate out these, these issues? Um, they are so often co-joined. 70% is a pretty high number. I bet it's higher when you actually do some dissection. Talk about what's the trauma that is driving some of the behaviors, where does that come from, and how does that affect both um, substance abuse with self-medication and mental health symptomologies which are being self-medicated as well. Other questions? I could actually ask a question. Um, so I think obviously we're all in agreement that the correctional system is not equipped to deal with um, individuals who have substance abuse disorders or mental illness. Um, and I think we all agree uh, that alternatives to the correctional facilities or correctional system is important if we're going to deal with these people, either through drug treatment courts or mental health courts as an alternative, um, in, including rethinking our approach to how we handle these things in, in multifaceted ways, as Ann suggested. Um, what do you guys see as the biggest obstacle to getting policymakers and lawmakers and taxpayers to understand the benefits in terms of rehabilitative outcome, and as Tom suggested, maybe even cost savings that some of these alternatives might have. And more importantly, as Ann suggested, how do you get them to understand that if there is a cost savings to this by not incarcerating this population, how do they understand you still have to redirect at least some of those funds to some of these alternatives and support those. And in addition, what would you say to our future policymakers and lawmakers in the audience on uh, how they might affect that change? So obstacles and suggestions you could give to our future policymakers. Uh, obstacles, in my mind, are, uh, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but ignorance about what's actually going on. People have a knee-jerk reaction to um, hearing that someone has committed a crime or is a criminal. Um, someone has a knee-jerk reaction to seeing someone displaying mental health symptomologies. Um, there, were, there was a man who used to be on campus here who would, he wouldn't really bother anyone, but he would just be around. And he was always getting campus security called on him just for being around. That's a reaction that people have. How do we sort of break through some of those stigmas to say, these are, again, our neighbors, our fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters. Um, would you want to treat, um, you know, as, as Ann said, she has a great aunt. Would you want to treat your family member this way? Um, having them locked up sporadically just for being out and in the public, and you having a distaste for seeing them walking down the street in in um, in, a, in a clothes that you wouldn't wear. So to me, a lot of it's just the ignorance uh, uh, of the general ignorance. We broke through some of those stigmas um, again with showing the ridiculous amount of cost savings that you have by maintaining people safely in the community. And I hate to keep coming back to money, but guess what? That's when you're, when you're having a political conversation about what do you want to spend money on. Most people don't say they want to spend money on criminals, and they don't want to spend money on criminals with substance abuse and mental health issues. Um, so how do you get those people to come on board and support pumping the money that you would have pumped into having someone sitting in a cell into keeping that person safely in the community, you show them that you're gonna stabilize, if not maybe even lower, 
the community tax base. Um, and that's, that's a very, I'm sorry, that's a very yucky way to look at how to treat human beings. But again, that's how you get that other crowd to come in and say, okay, we'll support this. And we've been able to maintain these programs now for close to 18 years um, by taking that approach, which is there's always gonna be a, a group of folks who say this is the right thing to do, and there's gonna be another group of folks who say, thanks for not raising my property taxes. And those two groups together um, are the way we've sort of overcome that. Um, I think the state of New Hampshire is growing up in some ways. Um, we've been a small state for so long. We haven't had to really look at some of these issues. We've not had to really look at who are we incarcerating and why we're doing it. I know that at the state level, policymakers are looking at these issues, trying to figure out how are we gonna survive uh, moving into the 21st century uh, with limited funds to maintain um, these brick and mortar buildings and why are we going to do that and how are we gonna do that? Um, so the conversations are having, the pendulum is definitely swinging towards um, some of the things that we've done in Stratford County because I'm, I'm really proud to say, and I've only been a very small part of it, it's been a whole bunch of people that have made this happen. But we've been a, a stable model for other counties to look at to say, okay, those, those crazies over in Stratford County, because um, we're all Democrats, so they don't really trust us. They did this and they made it work and they saved a bundle of dough. Now maybe this is a safe thing for us to do too. I don't care why they come along to treat people the way we would want people to be treated, um, but these other counties that have come along after us and done the same thing, it builds up a record of success that helps the next county coming along come on board a little easier, the next jail um, to look at programming inside his facility and say, well, we're not reinventing the wheel. This is something that's been done and is a proven success. So I'm really proud to have been part of some of these initiatives for that reason, which is they're spreading for a good reason. Uh, but it's hard. It's hard to have those conversations. Um, we had it at the perfect time when we, were ha we had to build a jail. And we were going to have to spend X amount or Y amount. Um, and we had those two different options. And folks chose Y because it was a lower bill. But it meant keeping people in the community. So we were lucky. We had timing on our side. Um, a lot of places don't, and they have to have a really hard conversation with their constituents about what do we want to spend money on and why are we going to spend that money. Um, well, thank you for that question. Um, I, I come from a place where we had to build a new jail in Greensboro, and there was huge pressure to you know find alternatives, not put the money in there, not do it, and in fact, they built the jail anyway, right? We did not, you know, it was in Greensboro in North Carolina. The ground for these um, community alternatives um, They are not politically popular. And to me, one of the greatest obstacles is history. I'm living in a place where, you know, um, for us, racism, a history of violence, a history of dehumanizing people, a history of slavery runs really deep. I had done work in Louisiana, the same thing. Um, and that, that, to me, continues to pervade our politics. Um, in North Carolina, I believe that also happens in many other parts of the country too, to di differing degrees. But you know that this, um, I don't know if people have watched um, the documentary 13th or read the book New Jim Crow, right? That even if, um, at least in North Carolina, when we try to have these conversations around finding community alternatives, around reducing incarcerations, it's slightly incremental, but um, often it comes back to very racially divided politics in our state. Um, so to me, history is one of the biggest obstacles, and this is where for us, um, uh, a lot of people organizing around racial justice, trying to educate people not only around people with mental health conditions, but um, around implicit bias in the criminal legal system um, is big. I also think that one of the biggest obstacles we also face um, is 
as we are able to create alternatives, how do we not create new institutions that replace them, right? We had these unjust um, mental health institutions, mental hospitals, prisons arose. For me, I worked on a campaign in Louisiana to close down a number of youth prisons. One of them was the Gina um, Detention Center there, um, and we had a, a we found many community alternatives. That detention center is now, um, for it had been for use, it is now one of the largest ICE detention centers in the region, right? So as we're trying to work to decarcerate prisons, what, how are we doing, how are we increasing criminalization in the immigration process? So for me, history runs deep and it's an obstacle to both decarcerating our prison system, but also in the process of doing it, not having a new system emerge that 50 years from now we're trying to also dismantle. Well, I believe that one of the biggest obstacles is public education. So there are many people that don't know about drug courts, mental health courts, I mean, how many people in this room even know that there's a commission that's going on right now to study whether or not they should expand mental health courts in New Hampshire? I know Tom does, Tom sits on it. <laughs> but that, that it's education, it's educating the public as to what mental health and substance abuse really looks like, what does it look like in the incarceration system, and what alternatives are out there. People don't know that there's alternatives out there, and that is what we need to do. We need to make sure that people are as informed as they can be about these issues, and it's hard to do that because for so long, as, as Tom has said earlier, people were like, well, that's their choice. That's, that's their mistake, and no one wants to help actually correct the problem. So educating people as to what the problem is and how, what the solution is, it's not, just, it's not just identifying problems. Anyone can identify a problem. It's actually finding the solutions and applying them is, is, is the thing. And as far as the cost savings, it's an investment. The money that's saved, I believe that it was over, over $60,000 that Grafton County saved just on those 46 participants, just medication costs alone to treat them. Over $60,000 on those 46 patients. And that's not, even, that's not even talking about the savings that would have happened from not keeping them incarcerated, from keeping them not, from them not being in the prison. That type of money that's being saved is an investment. Every person that we keep from going into the prison, we are minimizing the risk of them actually becoming criminalized. Being a criminal, to me, in my opinion, isn't just a matter of a person who commits a crime. Being a criminal is actively and consciously living a, a legal lifestyle. And that happens when you keep people in an environment where they are around people, like Tom said, who do not care about fixing themselves, they don't care about anything else other than what they want to do. And that mentality can spread, and this is that investment. Because the people that are coming home, the people that are locked up, they're going to come home, and we don't want them to come home worse off than when they went in. And for the future policymakers that are out there, keep an open mind. Keep an open mind and really challenge yourself on these issues and think about it from outside the box. Not everything has to be the way that it's been. That is why we're here. We are here because we push the envelope, we push the box, and we try to explore other ways of finding solutions to the problems that have been going on since the 70s and the 1920s. So if you're out here and you're gonna be a future policymaker and you wanna do something, really think about how to push the envelope and how to address this situation because they haven't changed up to this point. So something that we're doing is wrong. We need to figure out what it is and figure out how to change it. So if ignorance is one of the largest obstacles I think all three of you have mentioned and education is um, a way to address that obstacle, then I think you guys have just educated our students a little bit tonight, so thank you for doing that. Uh. If, is, if there, is there, are there any other questions? Okay, we've got a couple questions up here. For all three of you, so yes, a lot of the obstacles you have mentioned are around ignorance, are around lack of education. 
What do you guys think would be the biggest contributor to mindset shift? Like for those who are not moved by the numbers, by those who are not moved by cost, what do you think you know, would contribute to helping shape people's thinking around this? Um, I'd like to, I'll just share that what I found in the records, um, or when, what I found when I was kind of studying the 70s and the 80s, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, is that the more reporting about things that there are, the more books that there are, the more documentaries, the more people are out and talking. That's often how people had their mindset shift, right? Um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was huge um, between getting people to think differently about mental hospitals and also that paired with constant activism, people then stepping in immediately saying, okay, here are some solutions, right? So people's mindsets were shifting along with that organizing, the advocacy that was happening to offer the solutions when there was the tipping point that people wanted change. Um, So to me, I'm heartened when I see, when I teach um, uh, to large lecture halls, um, the documentary 13th um, or um, uh, students read the new Jim Crow, you know, their minds are blown looking at the history of how things have come about and what what can be done to change. So I'm, I believe that, um, that those are the kinds of things that help make change along with advocates, activists offering those solutions such that people will change. Um, it also is state by state, you know, as states model it, um, then it replicating. That said, you guys are the boots on the ground. Um, so, you know, if you have thoughts too about what will um, help people change. So, what I believe will cause that mind shift to happen there, well, let's first of all, there are people out there that don't want to see this issue from a different perspective. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. And with that being said, it's not a matter of forcing people to change their minds on this issue. But there are some people that are in positions where we cannot just let them sit back and not take a look at this. We have to make sure that we're constantly showing them these issues because they're in the position to actually make a change one way or the other. For me, what I've noticed, the biggest shift comes from in, in, policy, in, in policy makers in particular, that shift comes from personal experience. The stats and numbers that we've been talking about aren't just stats and numbers. These, those numbers and stats reflect human lives. These are people at the end of the day. These are people that are going through real life experiences that other people may or may not ever imagine or even have to be through, go through. So having these people who are in the positions to make these changes actually deal with directly and indirectly impacted people, I think will bring that shift about. Because if you are a human and you have a heart, when you are around some of these people and you see the situations that they go through, if you don't have a mind shift, then this is not the time period for you. Yeah, Anne, Anne and Joseph said it really well. I'll tell you my own experiences, particularly speaking about uh, the addiction issue. I would attend any citizen forum that I could um, when I first got elected in 2008 and going forward and talk about this. And sometimes there'd be myself and two other people in a, in a small room talking about this, uh, about what does addiction mean? What does it mean for the person who's addicted? But what does it mean for the vicarious trauma of the family of the person who is suffering through this addiction and how are they also suffering and what services can be offered for them. And we would talk uh, about this and sometimes people, uh, as, as the opioid opiate epidemic in New Hampshire picked up steam, the rooms would get more and more filled. What I noticed is that people who, if people would approach me afterwards, they would say, uh, my daughter has a friend who has a roommate who has an addiction issue, can you offer any references or, or ability for that person to get some help. The, the relationship kept getting closer and closer to the point where people would say, it's my son, it's my daughter. And these were people who I had known for some period of time because as more politicians started to get on board with this stuff, 
Um, these were the same people who at the beginning, when the train was sort of leaving the station, when we were really getting into trouble in the early 2000s with, um, with the proliferation of pills uh, being available. These were the same people who maybe five or six years before were going, it's a bad choice, they deserve to die. That sounds harsh, but dozens of people have said that to me over time. These same people within a decade are saying, my son, my daughter, this is terrible. What are we going to do? Now, that's a terrible way to get people's minds changed, but the silver lining in it is that there are enough now first relation stories of enough people who now recognize this as being a real problem. It's not just a problem of the dirty people, the bad people, the people who don't look like me. It's all of us. It's a human condition, and it affects everybody, even in little rural Stratford County, where we are all right now. That's what's been the biggest change maker. Um, and now I enjoy coming into rooms where there are a lot of people assembled to talk about these issues. Uh, and then, as has already been alluded to by my colleagues up here, what's the next step? Once you talk it out, what are you actually going to do? Where are you going to put your money to make it happen? Or where are you going to put your volunteers to make it happen? Hello. I think just making sure it's. So, uh, my question is basically we've talked about like the institutions and like reforming mental health courts and this kind of stuff. But what can, what can police do on maybe the county or state level that may benefit in like treating and like helping preserve like societal like upbringing so there's no there's no major reactions or disfortunate circumstances like the, like the example that you discussed. That can be done. That's, thank you for asking that, because I, I meant to mention, um, you know, police officers in New Hampshire go through a set amount of weeks of, of police academy. There's talk about removing a couple of weeks of that time. It's a really, it's 16 weeks is not a long time to learn how to go out on the street and interact with people, not be seen as a threat, not elevate levels of, of threat. In other words, respond to someone who is having an episode and escalate that episode. Um, one of the things that we instituted here with our local police departments are CIT teams, crisis intervention teams. How to interact with someone who is having an acute situation and not make that situation worse because not only do, is that good for your community, but it's also good for your police force because you're keeping those officers safer, okay? You're not escalating. Um, so, you know, again, money, money, money. Having that curriculum in police departments would be in police academies is something that all of the area chiefs here in Stratford County have asked for. There's a misconception about uh, police officers. You know why police officers, most of them, become police officers? Is to help people. And a lot of them do it in the community where they grew up. That's important to them. And they know some of these folks, and they want to have more tools about how to respond and how to respond in a manner that doesn't make things worse. How to not make an arrest. Um, you know, but you've got to give the police a, a chance. You've got to give them some tools. And CIT training is one way to do that. Have that instituted at the state level. Have every new officer go through crisis intervention training. It's just smart training for any police officer in any situation, whether you have a mentally ill person or an addicted person or just a really angry person that just lost a job and is talking uh, about doing something harmful. Um, so, I mean, that's a, that's a small way to do it. Um, understanding the traumas that police officers go through too and being a lot more open about that, talking about that so that they can be well and healthy. Um, you know, and also just community policing programs where police officers are viewed as someone who is a safe man or woman to approach, um, to talk to, and to be friendly with. Um, you know, there's all, there's all sorts of community-based things that can happen as well. Uh, but the training that officers get is really, really important. And cutting that training by a couple of weeks doesn't seem like a good move to me. And not incorporating mental health training seems like a really, really bad idea. One last one up here. One last question. So um, my mom works as a psychiatrist, and in a day she can probably see maximum of 10 people, and that doesn't include like all the extra paperwork and all the things she has to do individually. But so what is the most feasible solution for actually getting people the help they need? Because 10 people a day is not really that many in terms of how many people are actually incarcerated right now that could use the help. 
at that entry level, a, a lot of what we do is trying to make sure that people have a form of ID and then get benefits so they can get benefits, so they can go and see your mom. Um, also working towards having them be open to the idea of going and seeing your mom or another provider and building up a relationship with that. So that's real basic fundamental stuff. If you're talking about the licensure issues and who people are allowed to see, it's a huge issue. We have clients in mental health court who um, are gonna get enrolled in our local community mental health center. They've gotta wait for six weeks for their intake, okay? And, and the dialogue that I have with them and the judge has with them and other team members is, well, I'll go rob a store because I'll get the help faster or I'll threaten to kill myself and I'll get the help faster. I mean, why are we pushing our clients to do these dire things in order to get the services that we all expect? They can just walk into a place and, and go and book an appointment with, with a provider. That's not the reality. I mean, the system is so broken for people accessing the services that they need. That's a huge part of the problem that we don't talk about. I'll just, I'll just very briefly say that I went to an, an international conference um, in which I was meeting with people from all these different um, countries all around the world. And one, one major stumbling block was our own medical system in that um, uh, ac guaranteed right to medical and mental, mental health care was something that so many of the countries had that we, we did not have. And it's getting to this question of being able to access um, medical care, psychiatric care, um, at the point of need rather than the point of law breaking. Um, so it's something for us to really think about as we're having all these healthcare debates, as you're assessing candidates who are talking about various healthcare proposals, um, what is our model of healthcare um, and how people access it? Well, considering what side of the fence I've been on when it comes to the law, these questions are kind of interesting. But uh, I would, to answer your question, I, I would say that what needs to happen is they need to just get it done. And, the, and when I say that, this is what I mean, is we can keep, when we want to do something, we get it done. We don't make excuses. We don't identify all these problems of why we can't get it. If we want to do something, we get it. We're hungry, we're going to get up and we're going to go eat. If we want something, we're going to go to the store and we're going to buy it. So when it comes to this, they need, policymakers need to institute more Clinicians, they need to they need to institute more places that people can see. Ten, if we have five people that are seeing ten people instead of one that's only seeing ten, you start to see the point that I'm trying to make. We we come up with all of this money all the time to to fund other things other than what's really important or what what I in my opinion is really important. Right now, they have, and this is touching on something that Tom just said in the in the. Department of Corrections right now, individuals who are trying to get substance abuse treatment can't get the substance abuse treatment that they're looking for unless they have dirty urns. So someone could be like, I know that I have a mental, I know that I have a substance abuse disorder and I'm asking to get into this program, but then they're being told, well, you can't get into the program because you have a dirty urine. So then what do they do? They turn around and then they go get high and then they relapse for a week just so that they can give a dirty urine and then get into a program. Like, that's a problem. Like, that doesn't even make any sense. This is not what should happen. We should be having more people that are available and ready to deal with these people so that we can see more, so that we can deal with more and have them, and have them rehabilitated. And I hope that answers your question. I don't know if it does. Thank you all very much. Let's give them a round of applause.